The scripture for this service is the First John chapter three verses fifteen to seventeen. Everyone who hates his brothers is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Amen. Senior Pastor will deliver 26th lecture on the first John. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, and those who are attending this service throughout the world, and those who are attending this service through the internet and GCN viewers, 1 John 3 15 says, Everyone who hates his brothers is a murderer. And you know that no mother has eternal life abiding in him. It doesn't have to be killing someone with knife to make it murder. God tells us that everyone who hates his brother is a mother. This verse is the um, It's the elaboration on the previous verses. The murder of Cain that we learned about in verse 12 also began from the feeling of hatred. So, you got to root out hatred from your heart. But I believe none of you hate someone unless you are a new Christian. Cain came to hate his brother Abel because God didn't accept his offering. But he was delighted with the offering of his brother Abel. God didn't discriminate against Cain unjustly. God accepted only the offering of Abel because Abel obeyed God, whereas Cain did not. It's the same with the uh, today's worship services. God can accept your service when you worship Him in spirit and truth. But if you don't, He doesn't accept it. When I ask you, do you keep the Lord's Day holy? Then most of you say, yes, I do. Of course, you came to church. But what I'm saying is, did you attend the morning service and evening service together? And did you worship God in spirit and truth? That's my question. And yet, Cain didn't think about his fault in the offering. Instead, he just held a grudge against God, and also he had hard feelings and hatred towards Abel. As the hatred grew, he eventually killed his brother when nobody else was around. Verse 15 says, Everyone who hates his brother is a mother. The seed of hatred grew up as the fruit called mother. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in the Old Testament times, People were punished by the law only when the sins were revealed in action. It's written, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If someone who intentionally killed another person, he was put to death. But in the New Testament, God says, just the harboring sin in mind is as much a sin as committing the sin in action. Matthew 5, 21 and 22, you have heard that you you have heard that ancestors were told you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, You good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court, and whoever says, You fool, shall be guilty enough to go into a fiery hell. She just taught us that harboring hatred in the mind is a sin even though it is not actually committing murder in action. But it, it is not just about hatred. Our Lord said in Matthew 5.28, But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in, her, in his heart. 
He is warning us that just the having adulterous thoughts is the same as committing adultery in action. It's all the same with another, I mean, other sinful natures, such as betrayal, greed, and changing mind. We have to cast away not just the outward actions of sin, but also sinful natures in our hearts. If you misunderstand this, you may think that it might be easier to be under the law like in the Old Testament, but it's not. It's not true. In the Old Testament, they had to keep the law with their own willpower, but in the New Testament, we have the helper, we have the helper, the Holy Spirit. With the work of the Holy Spirit, we can easily cast away not only sins in action, but also sins of the heart. In the Old Testament times, it didn't constitute a sin only if people didn't commit sin in action. So according to the measure of faith in the New Testament times, their faith were only at the first level or second. Therefore, they cannot go to the uh, good dwelling places in heaven. It's not easy for them to go to the third kingdom of heaven or above, except for those who are refined by God to become sanctified and to come into spirit and the whole spirit. It's not easy. It was difficult because they were not in the era of the Holy Spirit. When the non-Christians try to quit smoking or drinking, do you know how hard it is for them to quit on their own willpower? But through the works of the Holy Spirit, you can quit it so much. If you are just full of the Holy Spirit and grace, you come to hate what God hates, even if you used to like it very much. If you love God, you will hate it from your heart, and you will naturally cast it off. You don't strive to cast it off. The same goes for sins and evil. If you scrub dry clothes to get the dirt out, the dirt will not come out easily. But if you soak the clothes in water along with detergent, you can remove the dirt easily. In the same way, if you try to cast away sins with your own power, it's, it's hard. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, it will be easier. That means you gotta love God, and you gotta have faith. You gotta know why you should love God. You gotta have such a faith, and if you have faith and you love God, then it's not difficult to cast off sin. Since you don't have faith, it's hard to cast off sin. You can receive the uh, you can receive the help of the Holy Spirit when you diligently attend worship services and other meetings and pray fervently. When you receive the power to cast off sinful natures in the heart, the light of the truth will come into your heart, so the darkness goes away. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the verse saying it is saying the verse saying it is mother to hate our brothers does not apply to non-Christians. Non-Christians who do not know God cannot be saved anyway. This verse is a warning to those who say they have received the Holy Spirit, believe in the Lord, and know the will of God, but still hate their brothers. But it does not mean that because you hated someone once that you are a mother who has to go to hell. Nor does it mean that because you committed adultery once and must be stoned to death. God does not condemn those who try to cast away sins and love their brothers. They may still have unrighteousness remaining in their hearts, but when they accept the Lord and try to live a righteous life, God deems their effort to be their faith. But the problem is, with those who do not want to cast away sins at all, where it is hatred or an adulterous mind, they hold sins and evil inside them and keep on accepting the works of Satan. I'm talking about people who don't even try to cast off sins, whether it is hatred or adultery. Some of them become jealous of others and slander them even though they didn't do anything evil toward them. They hate others and try to bring them down just because they don't have the same thoughts or tastes. They develop enmity between them. They begin to ignore and do not talk to each other. They may even act as if they don't know each other. Today, sin is rampant. 
people tend to leave out or bully a particular person in groups, in schools or in workplaces. Just because they don't like a particular person or a classmate, they leave him out, look down on him, and bully him with evil intentions. I believe none of you here are doing such a things. Living in the darkness like that, they shouldn't say, I have accepted the Lord and all my sins are washed away by His precious blood. Even if the other person has caused a great harm, or even if he is evil, you must not hate him. The Lord's Prayer always says, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Don't you use the Lord's Prayer all the time? At the end of various services, you give the Lord's Prayer, probably more than once a day. So you memorize the Lord's Prayer. You know, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. As we also have forgiven our debtors. It mean, I mean, it is an option. It is a condition. We don't ask God to forgive us unconditionally. We say, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. We ask God to forgive us as we have forgiven others. But you hate someone, you don't forgive someone, you have ill feelings against someone, then you cannot receive an answer to your prayer because God doesn't forgive you. There is a condition as, have, you know, as we have forgiven our debtors. So as we do this, God will forgive us too. You hate someone and you don't forgive someone, yet you say, I haven't received the answer to my prayer. I haven't been healed. Why is that? Why can't you be healed when you have no wall of sin before God? Some say they believe in the Lord, but they become like a judge. They think it's natural that they do not love a particular person because the person did something wrong to them and they feel that he is evil. You just put the blame on others and let the hatred increase. It means you don't have faith, you don't have life in you. As in Revelation 21 8, the mother's part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, and they cannot be saved. Here is an example. As a newborn baby grows up, he first toddles about and then stands up. Later, he begins to walk step by step. At first, he cannot walk very well. He often, you know, falls down. But he just keeps on standing back, you know, and walking again and again. When the parents see him walk, you know, just a couple of steps, they are so proud of him. They wouldn't scold him. Why do you keep on falling down like a fool? Can't you even walk? Well, instead, that they rejoice and they say, Our son is already trying to walk. He took three steps already. On the other hand, if a baby is supposed to begin walking just to, you know, but just wants to lie down all the time, the parents would be worried. Or, if he tries to walk but give up you know, only because he falls down a couple of times, what would happen to him? He wouldn't be able to grow up normally. It's the same in our life as a Christian. If you still, if you still hate others, just like non-Christians, after having been a Christian for quite a while and knowing the truth, then you just give up loving others and say, I try to love my enemies, but I can't. Then God will be worried about you too. The enemy devil and Satan will keep on accusing you, and they will bring you tests and trials. You might even lose that little faith that you have, and thus you lose your salvation too. I hope that none of you here will be like this kind. I pray in the name of the Lord that you may diligently pray, practice the truth, cast off all the hatred and avoid the evil, and fill your hearts with love. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, 1 John 3.16 explains that we have to cultivate perfect love. It says, 
We know love by this, that He, our Lord, laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Jesus loved us, and He loved us even as He gave up His life for us. So we ought to do the same. Just as there are different you know, levels of faith, Love also has different levels. The highest level, which is the perfect love, is the love to give one's life just as Jesus did. Our Lord said in John 15, 13, Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. And it tells us to cultivate such love. Even the worldly people say they love somebody with all their life, but mostly it is fleshly love that changes. In a rare case, they do sacrifice themselves for someone else, but if they don't get anything in return, they get disappointed and their love turns into hatred. Proverbs 4.23 says, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. I said, everything depends on how we make up our minds. According to how we make up our minds, we can change our mind and betray someone, or we give our life for someone. If we can really give our life, we will not want anything in return. And this heart will not change even with the passage of time. We will be able to give our life and sacrifice all we have to seek the benefit of others. Jesus gave us such love. Mankind had enmity with God, for they obeyed the enemy devil and Satan, and yet God still sent His only begotten Son, Jesus, to this earth for them. The Son of God, who has created the heavens and the earth and all things in them, forsook all heavenly glory and came down to this earth in the body of mere creature, to redeem the sinners that He was breathed flogged and wore the thorns that were thrust down on his head. In the view of everyone, he was stripped naked, he was nailed through his hands and feet, and eventually he shed all his blood and water and died. It was the flogging that you and I were to receive. It was the thorns that we had to wear. It was the cross on which we had to be nailed and hung. But Jesus took all those sufferings for us even when we didn't even know about His love. He gave His life not only for His disciples he, who loved and followed Him, but also for those evil people who were st standing against Him. Even after seeing that sacrifice, those foolish and evil people mocked Jesus. But Jesus didn't give up on them either. In Luke 23, verse 34, He interceded for them and said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. He interceded for them. Even when He was wearing the crown, crown of thorns, nailed through His hands and feet, and His body was pierced with a spear. Even when he was being whipped, he prayed, Father, forgive them. Forgive them of their sins. He believed that if they received the Holy Spirit later, they would change and cast off sins. With that love, countless souls were saved by the name of Jesus Christ and he eventually received eternal life. This is perfect love. God is telling us to have this love for we have experienced and received such a love. For example, say somebody is treating you like an enemy and hates you so much. If you know the love of Jesus, who died for you while you were a sinner, you wouldn't confront him or hate him. You wouldn't want to decide who is right and wrong or try to pay back the pains that you have suffered. But you would try to have peace and melt down the heart of that person. Furthermore, you, understand, you would understand that person and try to give him good things. You pay back evil with goodness so that you will move the heart of that person. If you cultivate perfect love, you will love even your enemies, and you can love them to the point of giving of your life. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, if you cultivate the kind of heart with which you can give your life, you can act in love in everything. 
If you can die for that other person, what would you spare to save him? You can humble yourself and sacrifice yourself as much as needed, only if it is for the soul of another person. During the ministry of Jesus on this earth, He showed us His love in various forms. Seeing the souls who were like wandering flocks being spiritually ignored, He felt very sorry for them and He shed tears for them. He sometimes was hungry and spit sleepless, but He never said he, it was hard. He just kept on teaching the truth to the crowd that was coming to Him. healing them, making the disabled whole. He set demon-possessed free, and He showed people only goodness and love. To those who were suffering, He gave the comfort and hope of heaven. He sometimes harshly rebuked those who were arrogant and who didn't realize their evil. But even, in, even this was in His love to change them and lead them to receive salvation. He showed mercy to the woman who was caught in the act of committing adultery so that she could repent. He performed the miracle of five loaves and two fish to feed the hungry. His love that He showed on the cross was also shown in each moment of His everyday life through His sacrifice and devotion. If we too love our brothers with all our lives, we will humble and sacrifice ourselves and serve them. We wouldn't insist on our opinions, nor would we judge what is right and wrong in arguments. We would much insist on our opinions or judge for our own benefit. Even if the other person seems to look down on us or want to be served by us, we wouldn't have any problem with that. We can just withdraw our opinion, humble ourselves more to serve others, and believe them and bear with them until they repent and change. Sometimes we are cheated by people knowing that they are cheating us. It means we know we will suffer loss, but we still want to give that person a chance to repent and receive salvation by knowingly being cheated by him. If you can humble yourself without insisting on yourself, you are more than able to do that. Non-Christians might think this kind of action will only cause a loss and that it will look like we are being looked down upon by others. But God the Father is seeing everything, and He will not make our love useless. If we truly practice spiritual love and perfect love, God works for the good of everything. People come to give glory to God, saying your good deeds. Also, just as the souls can come into the love of the Lord and gain life from Him, many souls will be accepted and changed by your love. I hope that you can cultivate perfect love like that of the Lord, so that you can accept many souls and supply life to them. 1 John 3.17 explains how we are supposed to show this love in actual deeds. It says, But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? The love of God cannot abide in that kind of person. It's a lie to say he loves God, so God's love cannot abide in him. To cultivate spiritual love, we must not just cast, cast off evil from our heart, but we also have to show the substantial deeds of love. We shouldn't love just with lips, but in deeds and actions. James 2 verses 15 to 17 also talks about something similar. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Is that love? You can say, I love you, 
But is that love just mentioning with lips? There is no deeds of there is no deeds followed. Though you say, "Oh, what a pity that you are starving!" Wow, it's so shame that you are feeling cold without a coat. What is the use of it? You should give his coat. You should give your coat to that person at least, and say that. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is that being by itself. So there is faith which is dead, and there is faith which is alive. The book of James says, "Faith with no works is dead." It is an explanation of our faith, but not just faith. It is also about love having no value without the deeds that follow. Just as faith is perfected by the deeds, love can also be recognized by only. Only by the accompanying deeds. A famous missionary in China in 19th century went to visit a sick mother and her infant child. Seeing her wretched situation, the missionary was filled with sympathy, but he didn't have much with it. He just had a little money, about ten dollars, which was for his own living expenses. So he couldn't really give her anything, but thought, if I had just twenty dollars, I could give her ten. So he just consoled her with words: "Do not be discouraged. Believe in and rely on God the Father, who is full of mercy and love." So he didn't feel comfortable. He heard the voice of conscience. How hypocritical! I'm to deliver the love of God while I'm not helping this poor woman and still holding tightly, tightly to my money. Eventually, he gave all he had to that woman and went back with peace of mind. He didn't have anything to eat at that moment. Yet he was still happy. The next morning, something unexpected happened to this missionary, who had nothing to eat. A missionary offering of forty dollars was delivered to him, which was totally unpredicted. He was thankful to God for giving him daily bread, and he was even happier, for he experienced his good deeds were rewarded by God. If we don't help our brethren, even though the Holy Spirit is urging our heart, then we cannot say we have love in our heart. Some of you might think that you don't have anything, and you don't have any strength to help any brethren. But if you have just enough food for one meal, and you take a portion of it and share it with a person who is hungry, then it means you are a blessed person. No matter how difficult your situation is, if your children are starving and suffering, you will give food to them by saving from your own food and necessities. In this way, he who understands other people's situation and gives what is necessary to them is the one who has God's love in him. If you say, "I got so many things I need to buy, and I'll help others when I am better off," then even if you earn more, you will still need to buy more things, and you still will not see any chance to help others. Although you are not so well off, if you obey the guidance of the Holy Spirit to help your brethren, then God will surely fulfill your needs. Second Corinthians nine six says, "Now this I say: He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully." Second Corinthians nine verses nine and ten says, "As it is written, He scattered the broad; He gave to the poor. His righteousness endures forever." Now He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness.
It is the word of God, so it will be done without fail. If you show your love as action, God will fill you up more abundantly and you, will, you can help others more. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the highest law that we have to keep is love. Among the deeds of love, the Bible often mentions charitable works. Of course, if you ask which one is more important, the most important and the greatest act of love is to preach the gospel and plant faith in the souls for their salvation. But because we are living with physical bodies on this earth, we definitely need to meet the physical needs of the people too. Also, as Christians with weak faith experience the love of God by receiving charitable works, they can be more faithful in their lives as Christians. When the sons of Israel were going into the Canaan land, God advised them repeatedly to care for the poor in that land. Deuteronomy chapter 15 verses 10 to 11 says, You shall generously give to him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him. After doing charity work, if you regretfully think like, Oh, I shouldn't have done that much, how would God be pleased? You should feel happy after your charity work, I mean, after giving your money to others. Because of your charity works, others can get out of their poverty. They can pay off debt, and their whole families can be happy and feel released. So you should feel happy for them. They got their happiness and comfort back through your charity. If you do charity for a family, they stop arguing. And if they feel grace and love more deeply, they start to you know, lead their Christian lives you know, sincerely. Also, their delinquent in their children can feel the love of God from the charity, and they will live you know, new lives. So he says, you shall generously give to them, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him. Because for this thing, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all your undertakings. He says he will bless you. Would he say still when he sees his children doing good, good works? Wouldn't he want to bless them as much as 30, 60, 100 times as it gets poured into their hell lap? If our Father wants to give blessings, they surely come. For the poor will never cease to be in the land. Therefore, I command you, saying, You shall freely open your hand to your brother, to your needy and poor in your land. God told them to remember the poor and give generously to them when they had a feast after harvest or at other times of joy and sharing. When they were fasting to receive an answer from God, they still had to have mercy on the poor. When Israel lies and harvested, you know, they purposely dropped lots of rain on the field. They didn't take all according to the uh, commandment of God. You know, they should let the poor you know, pick up the grain and provide themselves. When the prophets were prophesying the forthcoming calamities on Israel for their corruption, God sternly rebuked them for forsaking the poor along with their other evil deeds. The Bible says how happy God is about good deeds and alms. In the book of Acts, people shared things in common. They sold their possessions and helped the poor. That's what early churches did. The same 
The same goes for the New Testament times. In the early church, the Christians sold their positions and shared, shared, them, shared them with everybody so that there would be no one who was poor or hungry in the church. Apostle Peter and Paul kept on saying they were thinking of the poor all the time, and they encouraged the Christians to help the needy. I tell you, brothers and sisters, once again, it is a duty for Christians to help those who are in need. That's why the all-time prayer point of our church includes charitable works along with the national and the world evangelization. When I was a novice Christian, I was praying that I would become a wealthy elder of a church and help everyone so that nobody would be in need in the church. And I will surely make this happen. I've become a pastor now, but still my hope is that no one in our church should be hungry or cold, and none of our students should stop studying because they cannot afford the tuition fees. That's why I've been doing my best in helping the needy, tightening up my belt. God then please bless me abundantly and let me do missionary and charitable works more greatly. It was the case with our church too. We've been helping other churches that ask for help since right after the start of the church. We never thought that we can't help others since we don't have enough for our own church and it is hard to help the needy in our church alone. Instead, we just try our best to help other churches. Then, God blessed us more and more so we could do more missionary and charitable works. Today, we are supporting many churches and missionaries around the world with all our strength. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when you help those who are in need, you should remember a couple of things. God can give you back blessings only when you help others in the truth. First, you shouldn't help those who are suffering a hardship as a punishment for their sins against God. We can learn this from those sailors who helped Jonah. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, but he didn't want to obey it, so he took a ship that was going to Tarshish, which is in the opposite direction. The ship encountered a storm in the middle of the sea, and they had to throw out all their luggages. The sailors came to know that the storm was caused by Jonah, and it would come down only by throwing Jonah out to the sea. But they couldn't do that immediately because of human sympathy. I guess the sailors were good people. They knew it was Jonah that caused them to face you know, a terrible storm. But they tried to survive together with Jonah, so they didn't throw him into the sea. Jonah told them to throw him in, but they didn't listen. They tried all means, and in the end, they threw Jonah into the sea. So they had to struggle against the storm for quite a while, and only when their own lives were threatened did they throw Jonah out. As in the above case, if someone is in trouble due to his commission of sin, we should first help him turn from his sins. If we keep on helping financially, even though he keeps on committing sins, helpers can also suffer together with the sinner. If we help that kind of person who disobeys God and sins, it's the same deeds as we build up the wall of sin and go against God. Though, even though there are those who didn't sin in front of God, it's not also right to unconditionally help them if they are too lazy to work. If we help lazy people, would it be of use? What about helping those who do drugs? They will spend the charity money getting drugs and hurting themselves. What about gamblers? If we help them, they still spend the money on gambling which, at the same time, makes us sinners, too. When we help lazy people, it's like we are supporting their laziness. And that's not right. If a healthy person does not work because he's lazy, we shouldn't help him, right? 
So there are some we can help, and others we should not. This is in essence making that person lazier and even more incapable. So, we should have discernment to, as to whether it is right before God to help the needy in such case. So when I want to help someone, first, I check if he keeps the Lord's Day holy and give tithes. When he doesn't and go against God, I shouldn't help him. A charitable work committee should keep this in mind, too, in the checking on keeping the Lord's Day holy and offering tithes. Mostly, we help senior citizens who doesn't get any help from their children or who cannot work because they are sick. And we also help those who are in a difficult situation when they are uh, the members who love God and try to live by the truth. And one more thing we have to remember is that we cannot receive any reward from God if we help the poor to make our names known and to boast of it. So, the charity we do, we do to boast about, it cannot be rewarded by God. Our Lord said in Matthew 6, 2, So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. So we shouldn't boast about our charity works. Truly, I say to you, they have their rewards in full. If one boasts about his charity work, he already gets his reward from men who might think he's a good guy to help others like that. The reward is already given like this. There's nothing he can get from God because he, his reward was already given by man. This kind of charitable work is not true charity. When the children of God help others, they must not do it to brag about it, but to deliver the love of God and save the souls. Well, I'll call it a day here. Let's receive senior pastor's prayer for the sick on the screen. Lay your hand on the sick part of your body. If you are not sick, lay your hand on your chest and receive this prayer for the desires of your heart. Hallelujah, Almighty Father God of love. Please lay your hands on those, those who are receiving this prayer now. By transcending space and time, show your works to your children who are receiving this prayer on the internet and through GCN in brain churches and local sanctuaries around the world. Give them the faith to believe, drive away their negative thoughts and doubts, and drive away all their tests and trials. From head to toe, all entrails, joints, nerves, tissues and cells, whatever the sick part may be, Burn them with the fire of the Holy Spirit and with the original light. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, all diseases, germs, viruses, infirmities, go away, may the light come. Scorch all the terminal and incurable diseases with the fire of the Holy Spirit. Drive away all their endemic diseases such as malaria. All contagious diseases such as cold, flu, and fever go away. Protect them from all kinds of germs and viruses. Heal them of stomach, lung, liver, breast, uterine, intestinal, and all other cancers. AIDS, leukemia, cerebral apoplexy, high and low blood pressure, diabetes, thyroid, heart, lung, and women's diseases, and all inflammations be cleansed and go away. Heal of polio, stroke, arthritis, and herniated discs. Back pain, headache, neuralgia, and all other pains go away. Epilepsy, autism, depression, neurosis, and other mental diseases go away. All kinds of paralysis be loosened. You get up, walk, and leave. Let the eyes see well, let the ears hear well. Let the blind come to see, the deaf come to hear, and mute come to speak. 
He held them all after effects of all kinds of accidents and fixed their broken bones. Let the heat and burning sensation go away, restore them from burns, and let there be no burning scars left. All kinds of drug addictions, poisoning, and substance abuse go away. Let the dead nerves, tissues, and cells be regenerated and bring the dead back to life. Give them the blessing of conception. May you receive the blessing of conception. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan and the ruler of the air, go away. And their servants also go away. Go away, you evil, unclean, false, and deceitful spirits, separating spirits and all forces of darkness, loose on the bonds of wickedness. Darkness, you go away. May the light come. Father God, give them strength to cry it out in prayer, to cast off sins, and to be sanctified. As their spirit and soul prosper, let all things go with them, and let their family be evangelized. Protect them from all kinds of accidents and disasters, and bless them to lead a prosperous lives without any problems. With the firewall of the Holy Spirit, with heavenly hosts and angels, and with your blazing eyes, protect all your children, their family, their workplace, and business. Give our students wisdom and understanding, and give them fervor and passion to study hard. Keep their hearts and minds from the worldly things, and bless them to love Father God all the more fervently. Whether your children eat, drink, or whatever they may do, let them do it all for the glory of Father God. Let them say, I met God, I experienced God, I received answers and blessings. Let them testify with their lips like this. Father God, thank you. Be glorified alone. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Sure, I